mm-hmm. as you probably saw. So where did the Inuit live and how long have you lived there? We Inuit live in the Arctic, uh, in Greenland, in Canada, in uh, Siberia, and in Alaska, USA. We're 155,000 total in the Arctic, in the circumpolar world. And how long have you lived there? Well, history differs a little bit, but I think several thousand years. I have heard 3,000 years. It could be a little longer than that, but a few thousand years at least. So can you describe for an audience that's never been to your land what it looks like, what the Inuit lands look like? Depending on the seasons, um, and of course we have winter much longer than any other season, and we would love to keep it that way. Um, There is a lot of wonderful whiteness up in the Arctic. It's very majestic, and unless you have been there, it's difficult to describe it as this really majestic, warm, nurturing place. Most people tend to see the Arctic as, and and describe it as harsh, uh, a foreboding land, difficult to to live in with difficult environmental and weather conditions. But for us as Inuit, we see it very much as a a very warm and nurturing land that is filled with lots of ice and snow And in the summer and in the spring, it can become very vibrant with the different colors of the Arctic flowers as well and the tundra that turns anywhere from shades of yellow flowers to purple flowers. Uh, It's it's a very beautiful country. And in the, in fact, in the fall too, we, we get colors. The lichen turns orange and brown. And so that kind of, um, Uh, description is just different shades of every color. And our sky, the Arctic is well known for its pink sky, and the sunsets are just remarkable, very bright pink. Uh, The aurora borealis that dances in our skies at night, which are the northern lights, of course, especially in the fall and winter, are absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. Um, Yes, I'm representing um, the Inuit of the Arctic under the organization of the Inuit Circumpolar Conference. And I represent as chair uh, the interests and rights of Inuit of the Arctic. We live in Greenland, we live in Canada, we live in Alaska, USA, and we live in Chukotka, Russia, which is in Siberia. And we total 155,000 in the world. Uh, We are a people that are separated by geographical boundaries and nation boundaries, but we really are one people. We have a common language, uh, we have a common history, we have common legends, song, dance, uh, culture, hunting, all of these things are, are very much the same. We have different dialects in our language. In fact, we have different dialects within our own countries, but it is the same root language. And so there definitely, there is no doubt that we all started somewhere at one time in history at the same place. And I I think through, um, you know, migration across, we, we must have gone from one place that made us go up into those four countries in the circumpolar world in which we live today about the Arctic as an example of how we are all connected? Mm-hmm. Um, the issue, I think, when we're dealing with this issue of global warming, climate changes, I, th- I really do believe that it is because we have become so disconnected with ourselves uh, in, in terms of uh, our connection to our environment, from ourselves to, to the environment, our connection to, from ourselves with our neighbors. The issue of climate changes, I think, and um, global warming is one that, that has great opportunity to bring the, the people and, and this planet together to do the right thing. Because I firmly believe it is the disconnect between ourselves and the environment, the disconnect between ourselves and our neighbors, that we are debating this issue of climate change in the first place. And if we can learn from the Arctic story of a people that are so few in number on this planet that are grappling to maintain 
their hunting cultural way of life. Um, I think this has potential to bring the people of the world together. I think we need to look at connectivity issues. I think it is through connectivity that we can come to this common ground of addressing the issue of climate change and global warming. It is through that story and through what is happening, not just in terms of the science, because the science is so clear that we are all connected. As I said earlier, as the Arctic melts, other, other areas of the world are sinking. And you can't get clearer than that in terms of understanding connectivity. But in terms of the human spirit and humanity coming together as one is really important. And I've always said the disposable world we have become, the SUVs that we drive, the, the policies that we support or not support in industry, in, in politics, is very much connected to the Inuit hunters falling through the thinning ice in the Arctic. And that connectivity is something that we have to foster now as peoples of this planet. And we have to have a sense of responsibility to one another. And, that, and it, it is through that resonance, I believe, that we can really start that issue of connectedness to one another. Let's talk about speed of, of the change. Again, mm. you've been alluding to it, but I love, we love it isolated. <clears throat> discussion about how fast the global warming has overtaken right. and what is your prediction right. given what you're seeing? Right. Well, um, the, the, the evidence, the impacts, the human impacts in particularly of what's happening with global warming, climate changes in the Arctic, it is happening first and fastest in the Arctic. Now there are different reasons for that, but the main one of course is that we as a people whose culture depends on the ice, the snow, the cold, are witnessing the most minute of changes to the warming of this planet. So it, it's logical that people who are on top of the world where the ice exists on this planet are the ones that are witnessing it first. And it is happening very fast. In fact, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, which is an assessment that brought together over 300 scientists from 15 countries um, where everybody was involved, including many scientists from the United States. It was chaired by an American, Bob Correll, um, brought together traditional knowledge through this entire process, very groundbreaking in that sense, has now indicated that the, by the end of the century, perhaps even in a few decades, the Arctic will be very, quite ice-free, in, especially in, in, uh, in the summertime. Um, and, and we are witnessing that very, very quickly. And in fact, in my own lifetime, if I can personalize that, as a child where I was born, I never wore shorts or t-shirts in the summertime because it was still not warm enough. Today in my home community of Kujuak, people swim in the river where we were never able to go in because it was too cold for, for weeks on end because it reaches up to 30 degrees Celsius. This is almost unheard of. It is happening so quickly that in Baffin Island where I live, on February the 26th, we reached 6 degrees Celsius, which is 47 degrees Fahrenheit, and it rained for several days. When I woke up, my backyard of the tundra that was once covered in snow, blanketed in snow, was all dark tundra. And the ice on the Frobisher Bay where I live was just a crust, a complete crust of ice. These are things, and we had lightning twice that night. We barely have lightning in the summer in the Arctic, much less in the winter. So this is way beyond any experience of ours that we remember. And so it's, it's important to, to continue to be versed on, on, on the science that it is so compelling that even the predictions that the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment indicated where our way of life would be completely altered by the end of the century, we're starting to see that things are happening even faster than what scientists have indicated in those kinds of assessments. And so I think we have to look to the Arctic even more as the real canary in the coal mine, uh, as the early warning 
for the rest of this planet because, you know, I say early warning. I think it's becoming late for us in the Arctic, maybe still early enough for you who are south of the Arctic regions. These are real. They're today. It's not a theory in the future. It is today, and they're happening very, very fast. This is kind of a funny question, but um, RAND, you know, is a local sort of um, military strategy think tank here, and one of the guys who studies climate change in terms of national security said, oh, the Arctic's gone. Polar bears are gone. You know, nothing we do now will save that. And, you know, he can say that because he's down here. It's a mm -hmm. horrible thing to say. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? And, and are things like, are, are species like polar bears doomed, do you think? Or what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, the work that I'm doing and the work that Inuit Circumpolar Conference has been doing to protect the um, cultural way of life of our people, you know, as I say, it brings us all back to connectivity and the purpose of not only peoples of this planet and the role and the sense of purpose that we all have depending, you know, uh, uh, where we live, connected to where we live. The ecosystems of the Arctic are absolutely necessary for the well-being of this planet. So if the ecosystem of the Arctic, whether it be the lichen, whether it be its wildlife, the, 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 the flora, the animals, the ice, all of that is going to have a negative impact on the rest of the world. And it is naive of people to think that, oh, it doesn't matter if the polar bear becomes extinct. It doesn't matter if the Inuit no longer can hunt. Let them assimilate and eat and buy their food in, in supermarkets like we do. None of it matters. I think it's very naive and it's very narrowly focused on how the entire well-being of this planet is connected and there is a real purpose and need for all of us to be here. Uh, and the ecosystems, it's like saying, oh, it's really not necessary for you to have um, your one, two lungs. Why can't you just have one? Uh, you can function with it. We can function without that. Or other parts of your body that is not required. We can do well without that. This planet is one for a reason. The ecosystems have been brought and are there uh, for a reason. People are at certain places on this planet for a reason. And I think that is what we need to focus on and not so much on those who are not even wanting or willing to see the importance of keeping the noble polar bear on the ice hunting his seal or having the Inuit remain a hunting people so we can remain the sentinel, the, the first line of defense for all changes to this planet. And that we as a people, I feel, if the world has a vested interest in keeping the Inuk hunter on the land because we will guard it not just for us but for the rest of the planet. Yeah. Well, uh, we forgot to ask this question at the beginning, but I really think we need to get it on tape and then we're almost done. Okay. Because what are your spiritual beliefs? Because Mine or our people's? The people's. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, not that it isn't different, right. but. Uh, uh, I'll have to talk about it in, in terms of historical context and all of that because uh, things have changed a lot. Oh, good. Idea. Okay, so there's, there's, there's all that. And, and I'm also um, cautious and respectful. In terms of, of spirituality, I mean, traditionally, of course, uh, we had a remarkable, in, in my uh, belief system and my uh, opinion on knowing a little, I, because I don't profess to know a lot, about our history in terms of religion and spirituality, but we had remarkable shamans in our, in our history. Shamans that were very connected to spirit, to source, and, and they were great leaders in our own tradition. And, um, and it, when the new uh, Christianity came into our lives, um, that was completely considered taboo. And when our people were converted to, whether it be Anglican religion or Catholic, uh, the shaman, shamanism was completely um, put out. It, it was completely uh, taken out of our way of life. And um, 
I found that sad. I find that sad because I think that is, that's when we were so connected, as I say, as a traditional people, uh, very connected to the rhythms and the cycles of all that was going on around us, keeping us very connected to that source. And I think it's the severing of that that has now also added to what is happening in terms of the dispiritedness of our communities. And uh, as much as I think the church has done well uh, in terms of being helpful to, to many communities and many of our people have taken on that faith, um, there is still a question in my mind as to really, has that really worked? And, and I, I, I think I believe in choices. I believe in people wanting to find the, the, the way in which they need to address and, and be spiritual in their lives. But I, I do have concerns about how religion sometimes can separate yourself from spirit in terms of creating that disconnect that I talk about that we really should be trying to create uh, a reconnect to ourselves and to each other. Um, and more recently, as a people, because we are very vulnerable in terms of the dispiritedness that has happened in our lives and the addictions that, that set in, there has been some movement of new funda uh, fundamental religion that has come into our communities. And I am still not quite sure how helpful that is going to be for us as a people. Uh, we are still in that place where we are grappling with many issues of trying to find uh, not only our rightful place in this new world order of globalization that affords us safety, respect, and a sense of real place, not only within our own nations, but in this world, but we are also still there grappling with issues of trying to find that sense of peace and that source that we used to have traditionally with shamanism and with many other remarkable connections to spirit and to source through our hunting culture. I'm going to ask, there's a little voice saying, ask the question. So I'm going to go with that. Okay. Um, you've talked about this already, but if you don't feel you've answered this, it's, can you give us, again, a journey of what it's like to be on the sea ice? Mm. Um, and, you know, what w is that journey like 30 years ago, and what's that like today? Would you like, would you think that's something that's useful? Well, um, yes, it is useful because it connects with the traditional knowledge being handed down. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that, um, that is very challenging about the thinning of, of the sea ice in the Arctic is not only the safety factor of now trying to travel safely on, a th on thinning ice and unpredictable conditions, but this unpredictability has now started to change all the rules of traditional knowledge being able to be passed down generation to generation by our elders and our hunters because the, the unpredictability of weather patterns, the unpredictability of conditions of the ice and the snow and the winds that come up now without any warnings whatsoever because of all of these changes, our elders and our hunters now, as they're teaching their sons and their grandsons say, well, this is the traditional knowledge that I can teach you. However, and there's, a, there's like a, a disclaimer, I believe it's called now, to say, however, it may not necessarily be so because these changes now are here. And the, the, what I teach you today, you always have to think in terms of the unpredictability of our climate now that is now in the Arctic. And so the ability now of, of this remarkable hunting culture, so full of wisdom, so full of knowledge, is now more difficult for our hunters to pass on to the next generation. And so the, the sea ice, as I say, yes, physically, is very difficult in terms of safety, but culturally, spiritually, it's also very difficult. It's creating that sense of uncertainty, and uncertainty is not where we want to be too much, because it is that that is now adding even more to uh, some of the challenges that we're faced as a people. How loud is the sound of melting sea ice? 
Well, it's it's more. It depends where you are. Um, if you're close to the glaciers that are melting, uh, you you know it can be much more profound in in terms of noise. If you are at uh, in Greenland, for example, and you see the the crevasses uh, there where the ice sheet is starting to to separate, you will hear the actual almost like a bubble of the the brook, like a river underneath that ice sheet that is now starting to lubricate that ice sheet. So I think it depends on where you are that you will hear uh, softer or louder uh, the, the melting of the snow ice. And of course, you can witness, in fact, uh, the actual melting of it by seeing how warm it gets in the summer and the actual breaking and the crashing of either glaciers falling off the, the, the sheet the, the ice sheets falling into the ocean or even icebergs that are now melting very quickly and breaking off and making loud crashing noises. So it really does depend where you are at the at the right time to be able to hear those noises. So of all the things that you've witnessed, what gives you the most hope? Um, what gives me the most hope in the work that I do and the travels that I, I do in you know whether it be part of the global community coming together to work together under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or United Nations Environment Program or whether it be speaking engagements to universities in, in the United States or to conferences or events like this. What gives me hope is that there seems to be more and more of a, a momentum, a resonance really, of, of um, this resonance of truth this resonance that people are starting to see and make those connections that what indeed is happening in the Arctic is really about all of us, that there is no disconnect anymore. Um, I know that we have a lot of work to do yet to bring the global community and of course governments on board to address this issue as effectively as they need to with a sense of urgency and immediacy. But I really have hope when I meet people wherever I go now that resonate with what I say, resonate with the Arctic Inuit story. And that gives me that sense of hope that this planet is still a compassionate world, that people are still good people who want to do the right thing. And it is through that s small connections that are made that I think somehow we will get to that place where there will be that critical mass, as they say, uh, that will tip. And I'm hoping that that tipping point of humanity coming together comes before the tipping point of global warming not being able to be stopped. What do we owe future generations? Everything. <laughs> we owe the future generations everything in terms of at least giving them the, the tools, the safety, the, everything that they require to make it. I know from our uh, history uh, and, and, and how we feel about trying to prepare our children for the future, uh, that's what this is all about. You know, when we talk about, I, I always talk about this issue of, um, how can I frame that? You, if you take away all of the, the issues in our daily lives, you know, whether it be uh, politics, whether it be the work that we do that are external to um, really that disconnect to ourselves. The bottom line really is that we are all here to ensure that we are giving all that we can to our children and our grandchildren, number one. That's why we're all here on this planet, is my belief, and that we do whatever we can to ensure that our children, our grandchildren, are given that sense of safety, that love, that security, so that they may carry on in their lives as individuals that remain connected to source, to spirit, to wisdom, and have a life that is fulfilling and meaningful for them. And so when you start to destroy the planet and you start to disconnect from the planet and think only in terms of today, short term, and not the long term for the next generations, then we're really doing 
a terrible disservice to the next generation. And so I don't know if it's so much a sense of owing to the, the next generation. It is really just a, a sense of responsibility that we have to take and, and own it, I guess, in that way um, to make sure that the next generation is given uh, an opportunity to live a fulfillment, fulfilling life that is um, healthy, that is um, giving them that opportunity to be able to make the choices so that there is not that sense of fear that what, they, what we have and what we had as, as children is something that they may lose. And we certainly feel that in the Arctic. The, the culture that I grew up with has given me such a foundation upon which I can do this work and connect and feel that I have a sense of purpose in this life that I have been given. I want my children and my grandchildren to have that. And I hope that everyone around the world can think in those terms. And I know there are many that do, that it is the, for the next generation that we are living this life for. I think what I would want, I want the world to understand through this message is that you know, even though we Inuit are struggling enormously, and yes, we have high suicide rates, yes, there are all of those things that are depicted always in the media of a society, the breakdown of our society. I want our young people, by modeling what, what I am doing and what others are doing in, in our leadership, is to model life and to model strength, to be able to assert our rights in a way that we are trying to because it is through the modeling of that strength, I think, that our young people will then follow suit and be able to say, well, that's survival and that's what we must do. Uh, I, think we, I, I think it's very important, even though we're the net recipients of persistent organic pollutants, even though we carry the brunt of globalization now in the Arctic in terms of our climate changing, I think it's very important that we not depict ourselves as powerless victims. I think it's very important that we portray that traditional strength that we've had for millennia that has carried us through to this day, even if we do have these challenges. Because as much as we have these challenges at the community family level of, from the first wave of tumultuous change, there is a parallel process happening just the same, where we wake up in the morning, we are still a laughing, smiling, strong people, very connected to our hunting way of life. And so it is that in, that I think we need to model for the next generation, is that pro-life energy, that ability to make it through even in the toughest of times, such as this what, that we're facing today.